let's pray as we get into the word of God. It's about 12 o'clock, 12.06 Eastern Daylight Savings Time <laughs> here in Apopka, Florida. And wherever you are, I don't, don't know what time it is, but I'm asking God like Joshua, like Joshua asked God to stop the earth. Now, he didn't stop the sun. He stopped the earth. We know that. And the earth stopped rotating long enough so that he could take care of business. And I'm praying that God would slow down time, that time would not be an impediment or an obstacle of me hearing the word of God. Because sincerely, God wants to speak to us today. Father, I am so delighted and thankful for your awesome, incredible word. Amos 3, 7 says, you will do nothing in secret, but you reveal it to the prophets who in return reveal it to us. We're not ignorant concerning the devices of the enemy. And if we open our eyes, we would see you. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, in these few moments we have, and I say few because I really don't want to preach long, so I'm asking the, you to, to, to lead me, guide my thoughts, keep me on point. Do not let me leave from the th main thought. But, God, may it be crystal clear that after we leave here, we'll know what you said. And it will not be about the preacher, how he said it, what he said, but I will be able to say, we will be able to say, I heard God speaking to me. And we'll give you the glory, we'll give you the honor, we'll bless you throughout eternity because you are worthy. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Uh, amen. Yes, your horns signify that you agree with me. Now, I, I can have what is called a protracted antithesis which simply means I can stay in the reality longer than I need to. Every sermon has what is called tension, and you resolve the plot. If you don't mind, let me just say hermeneutically, it's simply understanding the text and then bringing a homiletical thought, which is called a sermon, homiletics. And so when we talk about preaching, it's more of conveying a thought, and there can be no thought without an ideal and a predicate and a subject. In other words, to have a complete thought, you have to tell me what are you talking about and what are you saying about it. That's a complete thought. An ideal means to see. In other words, I hope you see this ideal or I hope you see what I see. And that was Paul's prayer when he said, I wish your eyes could be opened so that your understanding could be enhanced so that you can see the mystery of God, so that you can understand the height and the depth and the breadth of God. I wish you could open up your spiritual perception and get a, I mean, really, what he's saying is, I wish your telescope was big enough so you could see more galaxies. And it's not that we can't see them. In fact, people say we're discovering more galaxies. We're not discovering them. They've always been there. And what happens with man, we finally catch up with God by bu building apparatus, apparatuses that allow us to see what we could not see. Telescopes allow us to see micro bodies or microbes. In other words, when you develop an apparatus that gives you the ability to see what's out there, it changes your whole perspective. And the problem with some of us, not you all, but in another church where I preached a couple of months ago, maybe, maybe a couple of years ago, in another church, their perspective is limited. Therefore, based on what they see, they have their definition and meaning of their life. And what happens with many of us, we judge ourselves based on what we have gone through not where we are going and we come up with a false analogy of our circumstance and so I am not faith says in other words let me tell you what faith says faith says I'm look like I'm losing but I'm winning faith says I'm look like I'm down but I'm up faith says I look like I'm out but I'm in see faith is a substance of things hoped for evidence of things not seen in order to walk in the realm of spirituality You've got to have faith. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And many people are looking at the predicament in this world through the lens of the flesh. And you will never understand it unless your eyes are open. And so the title of the sermon, the message that I want to share with you is entitled, Wait For It. That's, that's the title. That's the title. Wait For It. You know, I've watched Facebook and I look at Instagram. And whenever I see the caption, wait for it, I know something is about to happen. 
Are, are you with me? Are you with me? In other words, I don't turn it off. It looks like nothing is going on. It looks like nothing is happening. And I come sometimes, I get impatient, and I don't watch it because I don't feel like waiting for it. And so I want to suggest that we as the people of God should not turn off or turn our head from waiting for it. Because, see, one day, you already know the end of the story, and every time we come to service, every time we come to church, it's amazing because children are the same way. That's why when children hear a nursery rhyme, they want to hear it over and over and over again. And it's not that they get tired of the story. They just like being put in a predicament and watching the result. Oh, y'all missed that. In other words, the Bible is simply God resolving human issues. And if we wait for it long enough, if we trust in the Lord with all our heart and understand that weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning, if I can just wait for it, something is about to happen. And that's why in the Bible, and I love this text. Now, you're going to have to study this for yourself. Psalm 73, that's the text. Psalm 73. In other words, that's the division. Psalms the 73rd division is where I want us to hang out. Because in this time, we need this text. This text would not release me. You know how you read in the Bible? There's certain verses or certain scripture that won't let you go. I, I mean, literally, I'm reading through the Bible again. Came to Psalms, the 73rd division. And the reason why I say division is written in songs. Don't ever get up in scripture reading. This just this extra, y'all. You don't have to pay for this. Don't get up and say, turn to Psalms chapter 33 or chapter 73. It's not chapters. You don't sound biblically literate when you say chapter, when you go to Psalms. So that's just extra. When you go to Psalms, say, turn with me to the 73rd Psalm, the division of Psalms. Okay, you got that? So 73rd division of Psalms, the 73rd division of Psalms. And I want to walk us through it, and I want you to wait for it. Now watch this. Watch this. This thing is sweet. I got to calm myself down because I've already seen the credits rolling at the end of the movie. I've already seen the plot resolved. I've already seen how the characters play out. I understand the drama. I understand the antithesis, and I recognize the thesis. I see the reality, and I see how it should be. And now I've got to raise a relevant question which the Bible will answer. So every sermon should have what is called a antithesis the reality and you can spend a lot of time there talking about how bad the world is I can tell you that it's so unfortunate that George Floyd died the way he did it's so unfortunate that other black men as well as black women are dying at the arms of police brutality I, I can tell you that you see that it's obvious and clear and that People can't even run down the street without being hunted like an animal and murdered like a dog. We are living in some terrible times, and I'm not here to talk about the race problem. I'm here to talk about a human problem, and race plays in it because I heard a preacher say, powerful sermon by a guy that preached last night, Ivor Myers, Pastor Ivor Myers. He explained that thing so clear to me. You got to watch that sermon. I'm, I'm giving it some prop because I want you to go watch this sermon that he preached on racism, and he talks about it. You got to see it in entirety. But he broke that thing down, and he, what he says simply is this, before I get into the word, he says that the problem is, is that humanity is a race, and the devil is angry with the human race, and what he does, he wants to destroy the human race. And it makes sense when I understand the Bible. He wants to destroy the human race because he hates the human race. He doesn't hate the black race or the white race more than any race. He hates all races. And we as a human race, God created us in his image. And the problem is, is the devil has come down and what he used for his own good, he pits the races against each other. In other words, ethnoth comes from that word nation, which suggests 
ethnicity. So he, the nations will fight against nations or races will fight against races all because of the color of their skin. God didn't make a black race or a white race. God made the human race, but the devil uses race wars because he hates the human race. And God wants us to understand that the problem today is because the devil is the slave master and the devil has slaves on planet earth carrying out his bidding and slavery is seen in Galatians where it says you work the flesh and the flesh shows up in adultery and fornication and hatred anger variance so hatred is part of the weapon the devil uses to pit us against the human race and therefore we've got to open our eyes and understand that the problem we're living is is messed up jacked up and it will not get better until Jesus come however there is something we can do about it and so before I talk about it let's go to Psalm 73 now I want to show you something Psalm 73 you got your devices you got your Bible let's do a Bible study right now the Bible says in Psalms the 73rd division verse 1 truly God is good to Israel even to such as are a clean heart. Now, can I part right there for a moment? Because this deserves a shout. The word truly is an adverb. You know what an adverb is. It also, it describes what's coming next. It talks about what's coming next. In other words, an adverb is like um, truly God is good to Israel. Now, the word truly is usually used at the end of a letter. Truly, in other words, I'm saying truly or sincerely or without a doubt or absolutely or surely it is so. So when you put truly at the end of a letter, you are saying what I just wrote is truly. But the psalmist couldn't wait to the end of the division. He starts off by saying truly, surely, without a doubt, without a, I mean, I mean, show enough fact. God is good to Israel. Oh, I like that right there. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad God is good to me. I don't know about you. Can oh, Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to calm down. Whew. God is good to us. How I know he good? Put food on the table. You know I'm talking the truth. God is good because you don't deserve to be at this worship experience right now the way you act this week. But he gives you the benefit of doubt to walk up in or to drive up in a place of worship with clean hands because the text says even to such as are a clean heart. We know we don't have a clean heart, but I'm so glad. I rejoice that his righteousness becomes mine. And because David said, created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit. In other words, God says, I'm going to fix you so you can bless me. Oh, that's a good God. I'm going to change your perspective so your worship can be authentic. I'm going to do something to you that you cannot do to yourself so that you have the ability to bless me in worship because you're at your best when you worship me. Why? Because when you worship me, something happens to you. Oh, y'all missed that. Okay, okay, let me slow down. See, when you worship God, you're reaching out after God. Your circumstances was designed to keep you from reaching out after God. The, in other words, the devil wanted you to use your circumstance as an excuse not to reach out to God. It might be your marriage. It, it might be your children. It might be your finances. It might be your circumstances. But whatever it is, by any means necessary, the devil does not want you to reach out after God. Why? Because something happens when you, by faith, reach up to God because faith is the first step. God gives the second step. See, nobody ever advances without faith. Faith is the first response to God. And you can only respond to what you know. So let me tell you something that you don't know about yourself. The fact that you are responding to God tells me that you know something about God. Oh, you missed that. You missed that. 
you, you, you don't respond to stuff unless you know something about it. And so I don't care if your knowledge is limited. I don't care if it's broad. You must know something because you're responding. You can't respond without a little faith. And he's given a measure to everybody. That's why when you walk into a dark room, you don't question how many years or how many hours or how many moments the light wattage been running. You just turn on the switch. You got me? In other words, you don't walk in there and start debating with darkness. Oh, man, it's so dark in here. I wish it wasn't dark in here. You have a response to your circumstance. Your circumstance says it's dark. So what do you do? You go in there and you respond by hitting the switch, which means faith ha, is acting on what you know. Oh, y'all missed that. Faith is a response to act on what you know. So those who are not responding Maybe they don't know God. Oh, 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 I didn't mean to insult you. In other words, you might not know God. That's why you can't respond to God. That's what's wrong with the world. Maybe they just don't know God. And that's why the pen of inspiration paints it this way. After man's sin, it was the devil's desire to efface from us the knowledge of God. Because he knows without a doubt, I don't care how sinful you are, I don't care how bad you are, I don't care what you have done, I don't care what you are doing right now. The power of the blood of Jesus is able to fix your problem. See, see, and the devil doesn't want you to know that. The devil don't want you to know that. And let me tell you something else. Let me tell you something else that the preacher said. Let me tell you something else the preacher said. Y'all excuse me, but, but I got to share this with you. See, when um, the devil wants to keep us divided, and that's what Willie Lynch in his book talks about, and he says it will refuel itself. He says pitch the light-skinned folk against the dark-skinned folk. Pitch the, the women against the men. Do that, and it will fuel itself. Don't you know from 1619 to now, that's only about 350-something years. So we've been going through some jacked-up stuff because Willie Lynch came to the bank of a river, and he told the slave owners, y'all doing this thing all wrong. This is what you got to do. Number one, you got to keep them ignorant and don't let them come together. See, that's the devil. See, the devil knows that if enough of us come together, something happens. See, that's why I'm telling you, protest is about enough people coming together saying we don't like this that's why the devil doesn't want you to come together in your family that's why the devil doesn't want you to come together with your spouse that's why the devil doesn't want you to come together with your children because he knows something happening collectively when there is unity that's why he wants to keep the church from ever moving forward to fight over insignificant stuff like a bill uh, I'm sorry like stuff that doesn't mean anything and if everything if you can just keep them divided that's what the say that's what the slave owned Owner did on the plantation. Don't let them trust each other. Make the house Negro, not trust the field Negro. See, see watch this, watch this. And if they ever got together, it's a, it was against the law for about four or five of them to get together. Oh, 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 you. That's why they're intimidated when you come down a block and you see about five or six, seven people together. Oh, what they gonna do? What they doing? See, they figured if you get together, you might have a plan. So the so the so the slave owner said, "Don't let them get together." Woo, y'all missing this? Y'all So so what I'm saying is, God is good to Israel. He's good to us of a clean heart. But the devil's strategy is number one. Keep them ignorant of God's righteousness. Don't let, don't let them read the book. Oh, oh, that's another thing you can't do. Slaves weren't allowed to read. You start reading, you might straighten your back up. You get knowledge, you might, you might stop letting stuff happen in your life. So you get enough information, you are recognized you've been bamboozled, the wool been pulled over your eyes, and somebody been lying to you. When you start getting enough truth, the truth makes you free. And you'll stop walking around here like a slave. And you'll stop letting people mistreat you. And they tell me it's not what somebody call you, it's what you answer to. And the reason why some of us are answering to some stuff is because we are not knowledgeable of our birthright. You are a child of God. And right here in that verse... You know, y'all going to make it so I can't even get through the verses because I got to at least get to, I got to get to verse, I'm going to tell you right now, I got to get to at least verse 17 before the sermon is over with. And right now we at verse 1. So y'all pray for the preacher. Uh, okay, y'all pray, pray for the preacher. I, I'm at verse 1, so we got 16 more verses to go through. 
And so y'all pray for a brother. Okay, okay, okay. All right, okay. Truly, that's an adverb. Oh, oh, oh. But you know what? I shout, I shout because the next verse, there's a conjunction. So you got an adverb, and now you got a conjunction. But, oh, but, 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 but as for me, in other words, he says, I know God is good. I know he's gracious. I know he's merciful. I know he's kind and loving. I know he's all of that in a bag of chips, um, Doritos, the blue bag, and the red bag, Cheetos, the barbecue. I know God is good, but, oh, yeah, yeah, y'all watch that, watch that. Woo, that's a but, that's a holy but. I mean, that's a conjunction. I'm, I'm sorry. That's a but, but, but. You know what a but is? A conjunction. Junction, what's your function? You all heard me teach this before. It erases everything that comes before and introduces a new thought. What it's saying is, I know God is good, but. Well, what's the but? As for me, my feet were almost gone and my steps well nigh slipped. Oh, oh, oh. Y'all listen to what he's saying. He said, I know God is good, but I almost lost my way. I almost threw in the towel. I almost quit. I wanted to walk out and say, I'm through with y'all. I'm done. I'm finished. And you know how some people leave? They, 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 I'm through with the church. I'm through with you hypocrites. I'm through with you want to be. Y'all act like y'all going to be saved. And y'all talking about y'all love God and y'all mistreat me. Well, understand this. We all jacked up. We all got human frailty. And if some dust act up on you, don't quit on God. I'm pausing for effect, okay? Uh, 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 if dust act a fool on you, don't take it to heart. They always acting a fool like that. You just weren't around. Oh, y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. See, that's how they are all the time. And they just happen you to be in the vicinity and you get a little bit of who they are because you cannot not tell your story. You cannot not tell your story. Is some folk mad on their job, but they mad on vacation. I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where they are. They just jacked up because it ain't an ain't environment problem. It's a me problem. And the Bible says, the psalmist says, God is good. He's good to Israel. Even to those who have a clean heart that he made right. And by the way, righteousness doesn't come from right doing. It's a gift from God. But he says, for me, I almost lost my way. And I, I, I want to I wanna pause here because he said, I almost missed it. And saints, it would be a tragedy. It would be a terrible thing for you and I to live in hell and then go to hell. It would be a travesty. It, I mean, it would be terrible. It, it, it would be like something you can't even imagine to be as though you never were. And hell is not ever burning. Hell is being as though you never were. Obadiah 16 says you will be eradicated and you won't have existence. And it's difficult to understand existing and not existing when you never not exist. You missed that. See, you have never not exist in your mind. So as long as you have known about existing, that's all you know. And therefore, you don't know what it means to not exist. Because let me tell you something. I'm 60. When, you know, 61 years ago, I didn't exist. 62 years ago, I didn't exist. I mean, some of you 34, some of you 35 years ago, some of you 50 years, you didn't exist. Now, now, now this is my equation. There was a time you didn't exist. Somebody welcomes you, invites you to their party, and you start existing. And he says, based on these circumstances, you're going to stop existing unless you do something. And you don't do it? I mean, come on now. I almost lost my steps. Why? The next verse, real quick. There's a proposition. Verse 3, 4. See, 4 is a proposition. It's a word governing and usually preceding a noun or a pronoun and expressing a relation to another word or an element or cause. In other words, he says, but for me, I almost lost my step. And the preposition that he's using is, I almost left, lost my step. And my reason is, my reason is, I was envious looking at some foolish people. 
Now, now that's what he's saying. It's in the text. He says, my cause of almost losing my step. It may sound ridiculous. I know you may not understand it. I know you've been saved all your life. But for me, I started looking at foolish people, and I saw the prosperity of the wicked, how they kept getting richer and richer and richer. It almost made me throw in the towel, give up on God, and stop. When you look at this world and how it is set up, pay tax. You know what? I'm running on a rant now. If, if they taught you how to be an entrepreneur and how to business owner, then you stop paying taxes and you have your own business. You become your own boss. You pay taxes according to the expenses afterwards. In other words, they don't teach you that. We go to school to learn how to work for somebody else in a system that's set up for the top to get richer and the bottom to get poor. That's just what it is. That's the system. And unless you become an entrepreneur, think outside the box and have streams of income, multiple streams, and let money be passive. See, poor people work for their money. Rich people let their money work for them. And the system is designed that way. I shouldn't hate the player. I mean, hate the game. They don't hate the player. Hate the game. That's the game. That's the game. Watch this thing. This thing going to get sweet, I promise you. You, you, I, you promise, I promise you, because see, I'm going to share with you in the coming future a class on the theology of prophetic resistance, how we do it. I'm, I got a curriculum. I'm going to share it, and it's going to be deep, but I'm going to share with you just a little bit of this. When I'm talking about wait for it, I'm not talking about pie in the sky. He said occupy till I come. So there are some things I'm going to share with you that we need to understand, and therefore there's some things we need to do while we're waiting for it. Okay, watch this. He says, I almost lost my step. Why? For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. See, the rich don't have problems that the poor have. Bottom line. And verse 6, a conjunction again. Therefore, in other words, pride compasses them about. Because they so rich, they forget about us and get richer. Because they got so much and the system is designed for them to get more, their pride tells them based on what they have now determines their value. Because I got more than you, I'm better than you. Because I've been saved longer than you, I'm better than you. And it even creeps in the church. Because I've been walking with God for 25 years, I'm better than you because you only walk for him with him for one month. I, I, God doesn't look at the value of you, how long you've been walking with him. You, you, don't, you, you don't get no, <laughs> there's no seniority in the eyes of God. I, I mean, come on. And then you got people that brag about it. Watch this, Pastor. Watch this, uh, Dick, Dick and Carter. Folk, folk will say, I've been in the way 30 years. I've been in the way 50 years. Huh. They get them brag about it. I, I, I've been, that's the problem. You need to get your behind out the way. I'm just going to be real. You need to get your, okay, okay, okay. I know I'm on, the, I'm, on, I'm on the camera and my wife is here and I better not act up. But you need to get your raunchy, sorry, hypocritical, non-loving behind out the way and let somebody see Jesus. See, we all talk about the world, but that stuff be mirrored in the church. See, even in the church, people say, why y'all got conferences? Why you got the white, black conferences? Why you got that conference? It's because our church mirrored the world at the time. So go back and do your history and your research. We got conferences, black and white, not because black folk wanted them. We got conferences by default. It was the white brethren that said, you need to minister to your people. And you need to get your people and minister to your people. And now economically, our people have put in so much money. And now they want us to come together. Who going to take our money? Mon mon I mean, you know, I'm not talking about, but I'm saying, who, who going to be the leader of that? Who going to lead that? Now, I mean, who's going to be qualified to be a president? Will we get knocked out because of the color of our, I, I'm, I'm just saying, this even crept into the church. Seniority. Because my skin is this color, I'm better than you. I got value. And I want you to know that the psalmist says, their eyes stand out with fatness. That's verse 7. 
Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than their heart could wish. That's deep. I Googled the, the richest folk. I, I Googled that, and I found out that Je Jeff Be Bezos, Amazon, the brother worth $116.9 billion. I'm sorry. I'm about to insult him and say million. No, $116 billion, that's with a B, dollars. Bill Gates, $99 billion. The Arnott family, billion. Warren Buffett, $70 billion. Now, I'm not hating on the billions, but the text says their eyes stand out with fatness. They keep getting more and more. Now, I'm not questioning their philanthropic, their philanthropic um, giving and how they blessed other folk because I know they have. In fact, there was a young lady at Oakwood that got a Bill Gates scholarship, and she was blessed by him. I'm not talking about their giving. I'm not talking about their serving. I'm talking about the money that they get. I'm talking about the Bible says they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak softly. In other words, what happens is in the dominant narrative. Now, get this. I've got to teach this. I want to teach this. The dominant narrative. Remember that word, the dominant narrative. The dominant narrative is threatened when what they get, if you change the system, they're afraid they may not have. Oh, you missed that. The dominant narrative. Now, watch this. The dominant narrative is run by what is called the theology of the empire. Now, now you got to understand, saints, please, please, I want you to understand this. I know my time is almost over, but please hear me. The dominant narrative is they have what is called the theology of the empire. Now, you have Rome. You go all the way back to Greece. You go back to Medio Persia. You go back to Babylon, Assyria. Every empire has a narrative, and the truth of the, mat truth of the matter is you're going to live in somebody's imagination. The dominant narrative already has scripted what they want those individuals to do in their empire. They already know what they want you to do, and if you're not wise enough and understand the dominant narrative and what the lies behind it consist of, you'll never understand why we are living in this system. So let me expose the three lies of the dominant narrative that we need to understand. Number one, the theology of the lies of the dominant narrative, the theology of the empire, number one is this. Get this. This is why we have what we have. Please hear me. Please hear me. This is why we have what we have. This is the lie of the theology of the dominant narrative. Number one, some people matter more than others. That's number one. Okay, you, you know better than that, but that's the lie that drives the theology of the dominant narrative. There are some people that have more value than others. That's number one. We know that's a lie. Number two, the world is defined by scarcity of resources. You got that. Now, you need to be writing this down. In other words, number one, some people they see have value more than others. Number two, the dominant narrative sees scarcity of resources. Therefore, everybody can't get to it because there's scarcity. If we let you have some, it won't be anything for us. If you let you have some, then we're going to run out. If we let you become the head, then you're going to treat us wrong like we treated you. Watch this, saints. That's number two. Number three, we are a collection of individuals, and I am not my brother's keeper. That's number three. That's a lie, okay? Those are the three lies of the dominant narrative. Got to hear me today. That's why it's impossible to change this. Because the dominant narrative allows the rich to keep getting richer. Now, what I didn't know, and I'm not going to explore and go into it too deep, but don't you know they have what is called police brutality bonds? Uh, uh, you, you know, uh, okay. Police brutality bonds are bonds that insurance companies and financial institutions pay to families. They got to pay out money. Whose money do you think they're going to use? Taxpayers. The interest is taken from taxpayers' money to pay out when somebody is brutalized. You, 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 okay, you do your research. I, I'm telling you, that's why it can't stop. 
It's because the dominant narrative sees some people with no value. And in their eyes, people of color have no value. That's why they're sacrificed. That's why they're killed. That's why they get off. That's why police officers can walk with immunity. That's why the system has to be changed with legislation and policy that says if you do this, there's a consequence because there's value in that soul. There's value in that human being. You took his life not even thinking about it. It was a travesty for that man to be looking into a camera while he was taking that man's life. Why? Because the dominant narrative, they're not doing it, but they're endorsing it by their silence. And that's why not just for black folk, any white person, any black person, any brown person that doesn't speak up and say something, they are complicit with the dominant narrative. They are complicit of believing that value changes in people. That's why I say we got to get educated. And let me hurry up and get this thing finished. There's so much more, but watch this, watch this. The, the theology of resistance is about responding to these three lies. Okay, you got that, okay? The theology of resistance is us pushing back because we know according to the Bible, these are lies. These are lies. Every man made in the image of God has value. There's not a scarcity. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to God. And my God said, if you were hungry, I wouldn't even ask you. He said, the silver and the gold is mine. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else will be added. Bless, press down, run it over. If you need something, there is enough. Don't tell me there's a scarcity. But what America did in prophecy, Revelation 13, she looked like a lamb, but she spoke like a dragon. And she'd been speaking like that ever since they came over here and took the land from American Indians and then took black bodies from the bowels of Africa and made them build the country. And now we can't get a break, come out of slavery. And then you've got Jim, Jim Crow and you got lynching and police brutality. Won't you just give us a break? We helped build this place. Can't we get some love? Why? If we change the dominant narrative, somebody going to lose some money. And that's what it's about, power and money. And the love of money is the root. The love of money is the root. The love of it. And how I'm going to turn my back and turn my face and watch somebody die unless I'm driven by money. And the Bible says wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart. Their heart is not for fixing laws to help people. Their heart is with their money. All right, all right, preacher, you've been ranting long enough. Give me those three things that I got to do. Number one, number one, you've got to believe the lie. By, you got you to go against the lie by understanding we are made in the image of God, according to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. See, when God made the human race, he didn't make a white race, a black race. He made the human race. <laughs> he made a human race in the image of God. He made male and female. He, he didn't make male and male. He didn't make female and female. He made male and female, and they represented the image of God, the human race. And as a human race, we believe that all men are created equal, and the church should be preaching that. The church should be preaching that. Black men, white men, brown men are equal, and we're not based on who we are, based on color of our skin or based on how much money we have in the bank our value is determined because you are made in the image of God that homeless man down there on Park Avenue is has value because he's in the image of God that prostitute has value because she's the image of God that drunkard who keeps on drinking he has the image of God and what they want to do is make George Floyd the victim by saying well he had drugs in his system well he had a criminal past I don't care what he did he was valued in the eyes of God and if God is going to use our past to get us then all of us are jacked if God is going to use our past 
It's going to value somebody. I had this, this black girl. I don't even know. I ain't going to say her name. She came on Facebook deriding the man. Talking about he had this. Let me go all the way back to 1998 and start reading his criminal past. He did this and did this. And she said, out of all the black people, we're the only ones that want to support the scum of the earth. We're the only ones that want to help people at the lower bottom of our tier. We're the only ones that want to reach down and glorify criminals. No, we're not glorifying criminals. We're glorifying the image of God that God God made George Floyd, and he didn't have to die like that. That's our problem. We're not making him a hero. We're not saying that he's some martyr. We're saying America, the world, watch a derided, crazy, foolish, white cop murder a black man in the image of God. That's what got us pissed off. We're in the image of God, and we ain't going to apologize about that. I didn't make myself. It was God that made me. He made me black. I ain't got to apologize about being black. I ain't got to apologize about being white. I ain't got to apologize about being anything. And don't tell me you don't see color. Oh, 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 I don't see color. You lie, and the, and the truth ain't in you. You don't see color. Wait, wait a minute. Okay, okay, let's, let's, come on. Okay, I'm going to give you a test. You don't see color? No. What do you do when you come to a traffic light? You, you don't see color? If it's red, you stop. If it's green, you go. If you're yellow, you slow down. And you just told me you don't see color, then there's going to be a whole lot of accidents if you don't see color. And that's why America is having accidents because you don't see me as black and beautiful, made in the image of God. You better open your eyes and see color. It ain't a problem with color. It's your reaction to a color you don't like. I know this ain't popular, and I ain't preaching hate. I'm preaching truth. And number one, I told you the narrative is some people more, mean more than others, and the truth is we all in the image of God. I told you the world is defined as scarcity of resources. And I told you a Psalm 66 verse 9 says we live in God's abundance. There's more than enough. I, I mean, can you imagine we talking about, well, there ain't enough air. So I'm going to breathe all your air. It's enough for everybody. You better take your breath. And every time you breathe in and you breathe out, you better bless God. That was a gift from God. You know what? I'm so glad that we can breathe freely. I'm so glad. But he could not breathe. There was enough air for George Floyd, but somebody decided to be the, be the jury, the judge, the law. If, if, if they're going to be fair, at least get them to the court. Don't you kill them before they have a day in court where they can be said innocent until proven guilty. Don't kill them because you decide they're guilty. That there was no, no, no legislation. There was no defense. There was no prosecutor. There was nothing but you with a decision to take a life. And my last point right here, and then I'm going, I'm about to quit. Number three, we are a collection. No, no, no. We are all connected. See, the problem is whenever you think you can do church on your own, you got an issue. And there's some folks that are, I'm going to do me. What that mean? I'm going to do me. I don't, I don't need anybody. You a liar. You do need somebody. We are collective. We were made to need. In other words, I may not need you, but I want you. Why? Because fellowship is important. And fellowship is important because it brings us together. And the Bible said they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. And what I'm saying is the psalmist had a problem because he was living at a time when the dominant narrative was running stuff and he couldn't figure it out. So he said, when I'm looking around and see this, I'm all confused and I don't know what to do. And then he says, and I'm going to go ahead and end this thing because I, I don't know if my, y'all see my wife, she, she here. Y all, y all see. Okay, no, I'm just joking. She can't look at me. She gave me that look. Y'all would have quit a long time ago. Praise God for driving church because I can't see her. Amen. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, okay. That's why we've been together so long, y'all. We can, we can do that. You know, okay, okay. This, this is the text. Okay, I'm going to go to verse 14, which means we're about three verses away from the shout. So it says, for all the day long I've been plagued. 
and chasing every morning. I wake up every morning with this thing on my heart. Ever since that day and long before that, I, I, you know what? You know, it's a shame because see, I'm thinking about the grace of God. Now, this is no lie. They said it was a counterfeit money, counterfeit 20 that was a problem or counterfeit, you know, currency. And, and I've heard, I was hearing the narrative. They said what happened was he walked in, uh, his colleague, somebody with him, had gone into the store and gave it to one of the clerk or whatever, whatever and, and they said, no, this is counterfeit, and gave it back to that person, and that person walked out the store. And then they said George Floyd came back in with a counterfeit. Now, I'm just saying this is what they're saying, allegedly. George Ford, he came, Floyd came back in with currency that was counterfeit. He gave it to somebody walked out I guess evidently the manager came in on it and they they accosted him on the outside and that's where it all began over counterfeit now let me tell you something how easy this could be wrong I went to the bank I had just come back from a preaching moment and they had given me a check I went to regions I'm gonna say the name because they're the one gave it to me I went now not all banks bad but I'm just saying that the, I went to regions bank Cash this check, had several hundred dollar bills. I go to Wendy's to get me a Frosty and some fries. Yeah, yeah, you can make it on some Frosty and some fries. Uh, woo, I don't know about you all. He said your bread and water would be sure. I, I upped my game that day. <laughs> I didn't just have bread and water. I had fries and a Frosty. Y'all excuse me. But, but I'm saying I, I gave a hundred dollar bill to the lady while I was in drive through I gave it to her. I gave it a hundred dollar bill. Bam. And she comes back to the window. I'm sorry, we're going to have to keep this. This is counterfeit. I said, um, I said, hold up, hold up, hold up. Counterfeit. I said, I just opened up this envelope that the bank gave you, and I pulled, I slid one of those nice crispy hundreds out, you know, them color ones, and I gave it to the girl. She went, came back. You know how they take that mark and they hit it? I guess they took the mark and hit it, came back. We saw it. It's counterfeit. Homegirl said, we're going to have to keep it. I said, Y'all know y'all pastor saved, right? I'm saved, I'm saved. But I just had a few things running in my mind. I was just saying, I know I got an envelope full of other hundreds, but that hundred gonna be lonely if, if it, it's not back with the other hundred. So I say, uh, ma'am, what you mean? She said, we're gonna have to keep it. I said, oh, wait a minute, I'll tell you what. Call the police, get your manager, call your supervisor, cause I'm gonna sit in this drive through right here until I get that hundred back. So y'all y'all make up your mind, I shall not be moved. <laughs> I wasn't leaving y'all. You, you know how hard money is. Y'all y'all know. Somebody took your hundred dollars. No, I know y'all saved. I know y'all been baptized in the blood of Jesus. I know y'all y'all been walking with the Lord, but I'm like, uh-huh. Ma'am, we're gonna have to fix this. I tell you what, I'm gonna show you the bank teller receipt. See, see, I'm telling you, I just cashed it. They just gave me the money. Can I have it back with well, a policy? Say, I don't care about no policy. I'm talking about my hundred dollar bill. You can policy somebody else, but right now I need some my money. I, I need sit now. I started to go, you know, that the old ebonic. I need some my money now. So, I, so, so, so she said, okay, okay. And they talked. They went somewhere and got in the corner somewhere and talked. Finally, said, we better get this black man his money because we don't know what he finna do. Might do. You know how they are. You know how they is. And so, it, you know, he gave me back my money. I took that money. I drove down to the bank. I mean, I couldn't even stop the car good enough. And and the wheels. <laughs> I jumped out the car. I ran back up to the teller. The teller that gave me the money. I said, ma'am, look at here. I had an incident down there, and they told me this is counterfeit. I don't know what y'all did, but here is this money. Can I get another $100 bill? They said, oh, no, sir. We run them through the systems, and we don't know. I said, no, no, look at the receipt. I just got it. Let me show you the envelope. Crispy. All these other ones came from you. And she looked at it, and they ran it back, and they said, well, we're going to have to talk to somebody. I don't care who you talk to. I'm going to sit here. In fact, she said, would you sit in the lobby? I said, I'll sit wherever you want me to sit and I sat in the lobby and I said they're gonna do something because I ain't leaving nobody here till they tell me something and they came back and they said oh Mr. Bushner we are so sorry we don't know how this happened it slipped through our system and it is a counterfeit what if they had called the police on me what if I could have been considered doing something illegal when innocently I got a counterfeit bill? Now, I'm not saying that's the case there, but I'm saying you've got to let the process carry itself out. We are too finite to come to conclusions about anybody. And, and that's, I said that to say 
We don't know, any of us, how close we are to trouble. You, you don't know. I'm glad the angels of God encamped around about us. You don't know how close you were to that accident. You don't know how close you were to that mother about to knock you in your head who walked up on you but saw an angel standing by you. You don't know how close you are to death if it had not been for the Lord on our side. Praise God that he keeps us. I'm about to land the plane. Okay, okay. It's, about, it's almost 1 o'clock. No, you know what? The only reason why I'm quitting at one, the only reason why I went an hour is because I was standing there one time as I was waving, greeting somebody, and they told me, they said, Pastor, y'all quit too soon. I'm serious. I drove a whole hour and y'all engine service? I said, wait a minute. I drove an hour to get here and ain't nothing but the Sabbath. The sun ain't set. Why are y'all rushing us out of here? Okay, okay, that don't mean keep you longer, but that's just that's a little commercial. Okay, okay, okay. No, it's right here. Okay, verse 14. Come on, come on. I'll go back to the Bible. You don't know how close you are. This psalmist is upset. He says, for all day long I've been plagued. I've been jacked up every morning thinking about this. He says, if I say I will speak thus, behold, I will offend against the generation of the children. In other words, see, for me going on this rant, it's somebody right now upset with what I said. Because they offended. That's why he said, if I speak about it, I might offend the children of this generation. If I bring it out to light and expose it, somebody's going to be mad. They're probably going to take it down off Facebook. They're going to take it down. I don't know. They take stuff off YouTube anytime. But I'm saying, I, if I speak, he says, they're going to hold it against me. But then he says, verse 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. It was too painful for me. It was too painful for me. I'm, and, and tell the band to keep ready to start coming out. And, and, and praise him, get ready to sing some songs. They can, uh, let them get ready to come out because I'm, I'm, I need quitting music. See, saints, that's therapeutic for me. If I don't hear quitting music, I'm going to keep preaching. That means they ain't ready to stop. So I don't want to have a gap in between the service. So let them get ready because, see, I, I'm telling you, when I think about the injustice, when I think about what we have to go through, how, how we got to be smarter than the average, how we got to do more, just to get ahead, and sometimes they change the rules. You follow the rules, and then they change the rules to the game. And right when you think you got it, it's almost like standing in line, and you've been standing there for like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then right when you get up there, they put that sign up, close, go to the next lane. It, uh, I've been waiting here all this time. You're going to tell me to go to the next lane? I mean, how much more injustice? I mean, what? I'm not saying that's injustice, but it seemed like that's for us. They told us to go get an education, and we get one. They told us to do the best we can, and we be that. And then all of a sudden the rules change. Brothers and sisters, I thought about it. It's too painful for me sometimes to think about it. But I like what he said in verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. <laughs> he said it wasn't until I went into the sanctuary. He said it wasn't until I walked into the church or the sanctuary. See, the sanctuary is where God deals with sin. The sanctuary is where God can make the sinner righteous. The sanctuary is where God can be God without changing his law. But an innocent lamb has to die. Something innocent has to die in the sanctuary so I can go free. And when I go into the sanctuary and I see Jesus, the Lamb of God, that comes to take away the sins of the world, I say I can do it now. I see God can fix me now. I start rejoicing because it's not going to end bad. It's going to end great. Oh, okay. I went into the sanctuary. I understand their end. So when I, get, when I go into the sanctuary... I can see the altar. I can see the lava. I, I can see the bread stick. I can, I can see the candlestick. I can see the showbread. I see the mercy seat. I see the law of God, but above it, I see a Shekinah glory. I see angels looking down at the Shekinah glory, but I see a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, and I see that without the shedding of the blood, there's no remission of sins. I understand now that if I get under the covering of Jesus, I understand that if he's my savior and my prince and my covering, I have nothing to worry about. That's why I said, 
Wait for it. Wait for it. Trouble ain't going to last forever. Wait for it. You're going to go through hell. Jesus said in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But wait for it. Wait for it. I'm going to have the last say. I'm going to have the last word. I'm going to be God. Every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow that Jesus is Lord. <laughs> they, they're getting ready. But before they, before they sing you out of here, Check this out. I know things don't happen by accident in my life. I'm listening, I'm watching, I'm hearing. I was watching a police officer share his feelings about this whole thing. And man, it blessed me. I started not to listen to it. Because I got to even watch myself when it comes to officers. So I said, no, he may have something good. All officers are not bad. Come on, blow your horns. All police officers. All police officers are not bad. All police officers are not bad. I'm saying that. I'm saying that. I'm saying it clear. All police officers, just like all preachers, ain't good. Just like all elders ain't good. All deacons and deaconess ain't good. Just like all Christians and members ain't good. Jesus said, let the wheat and tear grow together. Let me determine who's good and who's bad. It's not for you to decide. So I listened to it. I listened to it. And saints, watch this. The officer was talking about training. He said, I, he said, that was so wrong. He said, police officer said, that's murder, and they should have known better because of their training. Now watch this. He said, their training. He said, we are taught that when you put handcuffs on a man, you've got to roll him on his side or sit him on his bottom. He says, or what happens, now watch this, saints. You have positional transfix, um, uh, asphyxiation. Positional asphyxiation. He says, when you put handcuffs on somebody, and because the way their hands are behind their back, it causes their lungs to expand, and they can't inhale and exhale. So they die of what is called positional asphyxiation only the training if he had just if he had just kicked in his training which tells you it was malicious his training should have said roll him on his side not only did they have the knee on the neck not only did they have a knee on his back but the training says you got handcuffs on him asphyxiation positional asphyxiation is taking place he cannot breathe in eight minutes and 40 something seconds no air is able to go in and out so he dies but when I went into the sanctuary I see God who thought it not robbery to be equal with God but took on the form of a servant took off his home court jersey called divinity put on his away jersey called humanity came down lived 33 years died on a oh, cross oh, oh hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. died on a cruel cross of positional asphyxiation he died he could not get air in his lungs every time he slumped down the nails in the ankles caused pain every time he pushed up every time he let nails in his wrist he could not breathe Jesus your savior murdered by the Roman government capital punishment if you please but he never had done anything wrong. Why did he die? When I go in the sanctuary, I see him dying for a dog like us. He died for you. He died for me. Why don't we respond to him in love? He gave us all. And here we are fighting over nothing, fighting over this, fighting over that. And my God intentionally put himself in harm's way. And died, hung his head. It is finished. It came up the ghost. Today, my brothers and sisters, wait for it. Wait for it. He may not come when you want him, but he's going to come right on time. 
You might be a little discouraged now. You might be looking around saying, what's going to happen? I promise you, wait for it. He that shall come will come and he will not tarry. My God will fight your battles. And as the praise team come and they sing whatever the Lord put on their heart, I need you to text or surrender. I think that number is 62488. I'm not sure. But you can email us. You can text us. If you want to surrender your life to Christ, let us know. You want to give your life to Jesus. Walk by faith and not by sight. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not unto thy own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. And my God will direct your steps. Don't give up. Don't get weary in well-doing. Trust in the Lord. Keep your eyes stayed on him. He'll keep you in perfect peace. And remember, wait for it. Wait for it. Amen.